A social worker is working with a high school student, Jamie, who is experiencing significant difficulties adjusting to a new school after moving to a different state. Jamie reports feeling isolated, missing friends from the previous school, and struggling to keep up with the new curriculum. Jamie's grades have declined and there are increasing concerns about his emotional well-being. As he has become withdrawn and unmotivated during a session, Jamie expresses a desire to return to his old school and community, stating that the current environment feels hostile and unwelcoming. The social worker decides to use Kurt Lewin's force field analysis to understand the factors affecting Jamie's adjustment and to develop a plan to support him. What should the social worker do next? So we have A, identify the driving restraining forces affecting Jamie's adjustment. We have B, suggest Jamie join a school club to make new friends. We've got C, recommend that Jamie meet with the school counselor weekly. And then we got D, discuss Jamie's feelings with his parents and involve them in the planning. All right, guys, so this, of course, is an application question. You would need to know about Kurt Lewin's horse field analysis um, in order to know this question, or you could guess. So let's start with A. Do we want to keep A, or do we want to throw A out? Keep A. Okay, we can keep it for now. And B, suggest Jamie join a school club to make new friends. Should we keep that or throw it out? Throw B out. Oh, no. Okay. Will do. All right. And C, recommend that Jamie meet with the school counselor. Should we keep that, guys? Or are we going to throw it out? What are we going to do with it? Keep. Okay. And what about D? Discuss Jamie's feelings with his parents and involve them in the planning. Keep D. I'm in keep D, not C. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, we're going to keep B crossed out because it ain't it. Because <laughs> that one definitely not it. And I'm going to cross out D because that one is gone as well. Okay, so now we're down to two. Now, you can look at this question a couple of different ways. The one thing I will say, this is an application question because it's testing your knowledge of a theory. Your job is to recognize that theory and understand how to apply it to the application question. So between A, identify the driving restraining forces affecting Jamie's adjustment, and then you got C, recommend that Jamie meet with the school counselor weekly. Which one of those would come first? Think of that, and I want you guys to think of Kurt Lewin's field analysis, but I also want you to remember what was his problem that he came in with. Okay, That's so right. I'm throwing you guys out some hints right now, okay? I go A I like 100. A. That helped y'all out, didn't it? When I said, look at what he came, <laughs> look at what he came. I see the chat, everyone saying A now. Now, do you guys understand? What, now, talk to me, guys, because I want to know how you're processing this. When you got between those two and I gave you a hint, because uh, it is A, by the way, when I said Kurt Lewin's force field analysis, that's the concept that they're testing. And then I told you to go back and look at what his presenting problem was and then look at the two answers and think about which one of those would come first. Did that help you decide? Yes. Good, because yeah. that's exactly what you need to do on the exam. Um, this is an application question, of course. You'll see more application on the clinical and the master's exam, um, but the rule still applies you have to be able to note what is the presenting problem of your client. And you have to be able to note and ask yourself, what is it that they're testing? Based on what they're testing, you either know it or you don't. But if you, again, if you don't have the right material to pull from with an example, you probably wouldn't get this question correct. So the two concepts that are related to Kurt Lewin's force field analysis is driving and restraining forces. That was embedded in answer A, which is a direct key concept related to Kurt Lewin's force field analysis, which is a human behavior question. So I'm gonna go through the rationales really quickly. So the correct answer, of course, is A, 
identify the driving restraining forces affecting Jamie's adjustment. Using Kurt Lewin's force field analysis, the social worker needs to first identify the driving forces, positive factors that support adjustment, and restraining forces, negative factors that hinder adjustment impacting Jamie. This step is crucial to understanding the dynamics at play and creating an effective intervention plan. So let's briefly, you guys, talk about why not the other options. B suggests Jamie join a school club to make new friends. While joining a school club might help Jamie make new friends and feel more integrated, this action is premature. The social worker needs to first understand the specific factors affecting Jamie's adjustment through the force field analysis before recommending specific activities. C, recommend that Jamie meet with the school weekly. Meeting with the school counselor could provide additional support for Jamie, but it doesn't address the immediate need to an analyze the forces influencing his adjustment. This option can be considered after the initial analysis to support ongoing intervention. Now let's look at D, discuss Jamie's feelings with his parents and involve them in the planning. Involving Jamie's parents can be beneficial, but the first step in force field analysis is to identify the driving and restraining forces. Parental involvement should come after a thorough understanding of the situation through initial analysis. Okay, so this approach ensures that the social worker systematically addresses the underlying issues affecting Jamie's adjustment before taking further steps. So this could be a bachelor's, master's, or clinical question. Um, and the reason why I say that, because Kurt Lewin is a human behavior theorist that would pop up in that content area. On the master's, again, that would be the second largest area of the master's exam. On the clinical, it is the third largest area of the exam. And on the bachelor's, because it's more recall, you could possibly see this. So again, you want to be very, very cognizant of when it comes to application, especially, you need to make sure you understand what they're testing. Um, does some, Mike, did you pop off the mic? Oh, I thought he did. <laughs> okay, we're going to go to question two. Was that explanation helpful for you guys? I guess at the silence, yes. it is. All right, <laughs> so we're going to go to two. A social worker is working with a client, Sam who has been experiencing significant challenges in maintaining a productive work routine. Sam often procrastinates, avoids completing important tasks, and exhibits inconsistent performance, leading to conflicts with the colleagues and supervisors. Despite a strong desire to improve, Sam feels stuck in a cycle of negative behavior. In previous sessions, the social worker has identified that Sam work behavior is influenced by both a lack of positive reinforcement for productive actions, an environment that inadvertently reinforces procrastination and avoidance. The social worker decides to apply B.F. Skinner's opera conditioning principles. What should the social worker do next? So we have A, identify and reinforce positive work behaviors. B, discuss the negative consequences of Sam's current behavior. We've got C, explore Sam's past experiences with rewards and punishments. Then we've got D, develop a behavior modification plan with clear goals. All right, so let's first look at A. Do we want to keep or eliminate A? Identify and reinforce positive work behaviors. Keep A. Okay, we can keep it for now. What about B? Any thoughts? I say toss it. Okay, we can definitely toss B. What about C? Explore Sam's past experiences with rewards and punishments. Do we want to keep it or do we want to toss it? Any thoughts? I said toss that one. Okay. We can definitely toss it. Okay. And D, develop a behavior modification plan for clear goals. Do we keep it or throw it out? I said keep D. Okay. So we're going to keep D. So I want you guys 
looking at that uh, link there, looking at the question, I'm going to do the same thing over again. This is an application question. Look at what the presenting problem of the client is. Look at the concept, BF Skinner Operant Conditioning Principles. You would need to know what operant conditioning looks like and how to apply it. Two, look at both those answer choices. If you are near a pencil or a pen, I'm going to give you guys a little tip. If the answer choice is too long, keep it very, very short. You can pick out what the concept is actually saying in the question. So for example, one key concept I say is reinforce positive work behaviors, just reinforce work behaviors. That keyword reinforce, I would definitely highlight. Then in D, develop a behavior modification plan with clear goals, okay? So what is this actually saying? I would highlight modification plan. You want to simplify your answer choices to help you decide, because for some people it can be too wordy, to help you decide what is the right intervention you should use that aligns with the theory that they're testing, okay? So with that, with having those two, A, identify and reinforce positive work behaviors, then you got D, develop a behavior modification plan with clear goals. Which one would you choose based on what you know about B.F. Skinner and what his presenting problem actually is? Then choose. Oh boy, I guess this is a tough question, huh? It's got real quiet. <laughs> I say A from, that's not my answer. Mm -hmm. Logan, I see your answer down there as well in the chat. Anybody else, Mike? I'll say A. Okay. So this one is going to be D, develop a behavior modification plan with clear goals. So let's talk about why it wouldn't be A. Let's start there. We're going to work away to why the answer is D. So while identifying and reinforcing positive behaviors is crucial, it should be part of a comprehensive behavior modification plan. Without a structured plan, the efforts may lack direction and consistency, which is why it would not be A. So even though you guys didn't pick the others, I am going to give an explanation for them just for podcast purposes. Discuss the negative consequences of Sam's current behavior. Focusing solely on the negative consequences can be discouraging and may not effectively promote behavior change. Positive reinforcement strategies are generally more effective in operate conditioning. And then C, explore Sam's past experiences with reward and punishment. Understanding past experiences can provide valuable context, but it does not directly address the need for a current actual plan to modify Sam's behavior. The focus should be on developing and implementing a plan that targets current behavior patterns. Okay, this is definitely a master's level question, human development, diversity, behavior, and environment, 27% of the master's exam, about 24% of the clinical exam. Um, so for my master's people, this is definitely uh, one of those concepts you definitely would see um, in the clinical, maybe not so much on the master's, some recall uh, in regards to the theory and its application. So in reference to the answer choice D, developing a behavior modification plan with clear goals is going to be the best next step, y'all. Um, that approach aligns with B.F. Skinner's opera conditioning principles by providing a more structured framework to address Sam's behavior issues. So the plan can include uh, specific strategies for reinforcing positive behaviors, and it minimizes reinforcement for negative behaviors, helping Sam to develop a more productive work routine. Okay, does that explanation help? Shana, don't beat yourself up. <laughs> Getting stuck between two, your best two, is uh, more than half the battle. You have a 50-50% 50, 50, uh, chance of getting it right. First, getting it to its best two, and then making sure you understand what the presenting problem is, and then choosing which one is going to be the most appropriate next or first most effective best answer. 
based on that presenting problem. And if the concept is there of what they're testing on, that as well, okay? Um, when it comes to BF Skinner opera conditioning, most people will confuse opera conditioning and classical conditioning because they're very close related, often used in behavior therapy. One of the ways to remember uh, opera conditioning, I can tell you right off the bat, um, keep it very simple. Opera conditioning is all about reinforcement. Reinforcement, whether positive or negative, guys, increases. Something I want you to remember. Extinction, which is another concept under BF Skinner, works a little differently. But here, that example that I'm giving you of reinforcement, remember it, it increases, no matter if it's positive or negative. When it comes to classical conditioning, even though this is not a question that I'm testing on right now, um, remember that unconditioned means that something has not been learned yet. Conditioned means that something has been learned. It's when two things are associated together. Most people get confused and think of Pavlov, um, Dobbs, an experiment that he did around meat powder. Okay, so hopefully that a uh, little um, explanation helped, but that was sort of the two common behavior therapy concepts and theories that people usually get confused. Of course, there's unconditioned and conditioned stimulus. Um, there are other concepts, but if you just focus on what unconditioned and conditioned means, you'll easily pick up the difference between stimulus um, as well as the other concepts that are there. So I'm going to go on to the next one. If you guys don't have any questions about that, hopefully that was explained a little thoroughly. Um, we're going to go to question three. A social worker is working with a client, Dana, who has been recently been diagnosed with bipolar one disorder. Dana has experienced severe mood swings ranging from extreme euphoria and high energy to deep depression and lethargy. During manic episodes, Dana engages in risky behaviors such as excessive spending and reckless driving, which has led to financial strain and legal issues. During depressive episodes, Dana isolates from family and friends, struggles to get out of bed, and has difficulty maintaining employment. Dana is currently in a depressive phase and is expressing feelings of hopelessness and frustration over the recurring nature of these episodes. The social worker needs to develop an intervention plan to help Dana manage her symptoms and stabilize her mood. What should the social worker do next? A, educate Dana about the importance of medication adherence and monitor her compliance. B, encourage Dana to join a support group for individuals with bipolar disorder. C, develop a crisis plan that includes coping strategies for both manic and depressive episodes. D, refer Dana to a psychiatrist for a medication evaluation. So let's start with A. Do we keep A or do we toss it out? What would you like to do with it? Toss it. Okay. B. What do we do with it? Get rid of it. B. What about C? Do we keep it or get rid of it? Keep it. And what about D? Do we keep it or get rid of it? Toss away. All right, so we are down to C, develop a crisis plan that incorporates coping strategies for manic and depressive episodes. That would be correct. So let's talk about why. Developing a crisis plan that includes coping strategies for both manic and depressive episodes is going to be the best next step. A crisis plan will provide Dana with structured and proactive strategies to manage her symptoms and reduce the impact of mood swings. This plan can include specific coping mechanisms, emergency contacts, and steps to take when she notices the onset of manic or depressive symptoms. It empowers Dana to take control of her condition and helps her stabilize her mood. So I'm gonna go over why not the others just for podcast purposes here. A, educate Dana about the importance of medication adherence and monitor her compliance. While educating Dana about medication adherence is important, it is only one aspect of managing bipolar one. 
a comprehensive crisis plan is needed to address both manic and depressive episodes effectively. B, encourage Dana to join a support group for individuals with bipolar disorder. Joining a support group can be beneficial, but it doesn't address the immediate need for a structured plan to manage Dana's mood swings. Support groups can be a part of the long-term strategy, but are not the immediate next step. D, refer Dana to a psychiatrist for a medication evaluation. Referring Dana to a psychiatrist is important for managing bipolar one, but the social worker should first develop a crisis plan to provide immediate support and coping strategies. This can be done in a parallel with a psychiatric referral. So this of course would be an assessment and intervention planning question for the master's exam, but you can also find it in the same content area for the clinical exam. So it's about 30% for the clinical, it's about 24% of the master's exam. First biggest section of the clinical exam. This section is tied for the master's uh, with interventions, which are about have the same amount of questions in both those areas. Um, so even for the master's, you still want to be very much well-versed in diagnosing. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next one. A social worker is working with a client, Maria, who has been experiencing symptoms of anxiety and depression. Following a recent divorce, Maria reports feeling overwhelmed by the responsibilities of single parenting and struggling to balance work, child care, and her personal needs. During sessions, Maria expresses feelings of inadequacy and fear that she is not providing a stable environment for her children. She often speaks about her ex-husband's critical comments, which have left her feeling demoralized. The social worker is in the initial phase of the helping process and needs to determine the best approach to support Maria in addressing her emotional and practical challenges. What should the social worker do next? So we have A, explore Maria's current support systems and their effectiveness, B, Discuss Maria's feelings about the divorce and her ex-husband's criticism. C, develop a concrete plan to address Maria's work-life balance issues. D, encourage Maria to join a support group for divorced single parents. Let's first start with A, do we keep it or do we throw it out? What are we going to do with it? Throw it out. B, do we keep it or do we throw it out? Keep it. Okay. C, do we keep it or throw it out? Throw it out. And D. Toss it. Alrighty then. So I'm going to throw out B. The answer is going to be A. Explore Maria's current systems and their effectiveness. So let's talk about that. So just for um, the sake of breaking this down, I'm going to go back before we do anything else. And if you guys could pull up, look at that link and kind of follow along. We're going to kind of break this down a little bit. I'm going to reread this um, because this is one of those questions where I feel like um, you really want to make sure you understand where you are in the treatment process. So Again, I'm going to paraphrase this. Maria, she has, she's presenting symptoms of anxiety and depression following recent divorce. Okay, there's my presenting problem. I'm just going to highlight that, pretend you've highlighted it. Anything else after that, you guys, are symptoms of the problem. So Maria reports feeling overwhelmed, okay, by the responsibility of single parenting and struggling to balance work, child care, and her personal needs. That's also part of the problem, but those are the symptoms during sessions, Maria expresses feelings of inadequacy and fears that she is not providing a stable environment for her children. Okay, that's another symptom. She often speaks about her ex-husband critical comments which have left her demoralized. So her self-esteem is hit. The social worker is in the initial phase of the helping process. I'm going to stop right there. Initial phase of the helping process. Something else you need to make sure you look for is where you are in the treatment process. Are you in termination? Are you in initial session? The reason why I'm bringing it up, guys, is because this is a question that's testing a couple of things. One of them is, do you know the assessment process and what skills should you be using to apply at this point in her process first? 
So that's one clue that I saw. And then, of course, it says she, the social worker needs to determine the best approach to support Maria in addressing her emotional and practical challenges. So again, we want to make sure we understand what the social worker is trying to do with her. So I'm going to go through the answer choices one by one. So B, discuss Maria's feelings about the divorce, her ex-husband's criticism. This is very important to do. However, it should not be the initial first step, y'all. The initial step should be focusing on understanding her current supports. That information will help the social worker provide more targeted emotional support later in the process. C, develop a concrete plan to address Maria's work-life balance issues. So developing a plan to address work-life balance is essential, but it should come after understanding the existing support systems, knowing who can provide help to her or resources, making any plans feasible and more effective for her. Um, and then we're going to look at D. Of course, this one will also be out. Encourage Maria to join a support group for divorced single parents. Encourage Maria to join a support group. That's beneficial, but it should follow the assessment of her current support system. The social worker needs to understand what support Maria already has before recommending any additional resources. So by first exploring Maria's supports, the social worker gains a more comprehensive view of her current situation, which is critical for effective assessment and intervention planning. So again, the current answer is explore Maria's current support and their effectiveness in the initial phase of the helping process, it's crucial to understand the client's current environment and their supports. By exploring those supports, the social worker can identify any strengths, any gaps in her network, which would also help her inform interventions that she could use with her and to build a foundation for emotional and practical support. Okay, so this would definitely be a psychotherapy clinical interventions and case management question. This is about 27%, the largest part of the clinical exam. Um, on the master's, I would say it's about, it's in third place, tied with assessment because they have the same amount of questions in both those content areas. Um, on the master's assessment and interventions, they both hold the same amount. But um, the hardest part for people, especially with content area three, is not only understanding the interventions, uh, but also understanding how to apply them, which is why I tell you guys all the time, you want to make sure that you not only are reading, reading not to memorize, but reading to understand, because you have to be able to apply that in the scenario. If I didn't pick up on the initial phase of the helping process and knowing what skills I should be using, I might have picked the wrong answer and totally missed that you're still in assessment. So what else you haven't assessed for? We don't know what her supports look like. Everything else are interventions that can go into place, but you gotta remember where you are in the process. Does that help in terms of just explaining why that is important, especially a question like this, because that's really most of your tests right there. You guys are so quiet now. <laughs> No, did I go on too long? Um, no, 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 you're right, you're right, you're right. Okay, <laughs> okay. All right, so we're going to go on to the next one. All right, a social worker is providing psychotherapy to a client, Sarah, who has been dealing with severe anxiety and panic attacks. Over the course of several sessions, Sarah has shared highly sensitive and personal information about her past traumas and current struggles. The social worker diligently keeps detailed psychotherapy notes to track Sarah's progress and to inform future sessions. One day, Sarah contacts the social worker in a massive panic, stating that her estranged husband, who is embroiled in a contentious custody battle with her, is attempting to gain access to her therapy records through a subpoena issued by his attorney. Sarah is extremely concerned about the potential impact this could have on her case and her privacy. The social worker needs to determine the appropriate action to take in line with the professional values and ethics regarding the confidentiality of psychotherapy notes. What should the social worker do next? A, inform Sarah that the psychotherapy notes are confidential and cannot be released without her consent. 
B, advise Sarah to contact her attorney to discuss legal options for protecting her records. C, review the request and determine if there are any legal exceptions that might require the release of the notes. D, offer to provide a summary of the therapy sessions instead of the detailed psychotherapy notes. All right, guys, you guys already know this is an ethics question, a big part of the master's exam, probably the first biggest area. Um, this would be the smallest area of the clinical exam. Anywho, so let's start with A. Do we keep A or are we throwing it out? Throw it out. All right. D, I mean B, do we keep it or throw it out? B is a boy, are we throwing it out? I was yeah. Oh, go ahead, Michael. I didn't mean to cut you off. Michael. I said I think I think I said keep B. Oh, you said keep B. Okay. All right, we'll keep it for now. Um what about oh Shayla, I'm sorry. Did you want to keep it or throw it out, Shayla? I'm getting a red bar. I don't know if you can hear me clearly. No, no, I can hear you. Yep, I can hear you. Uh, I said get rid of it. Okay. I am checking the chat as well. All right, so now we're down to two. Um, offer to provide a summary of the therapy sessions instead of the detailed psychotherapy notes. D, do we keep that or do we throw it out? What are we going to do, y'all? We're between B as in boy and D as in dog. So we got to figure out which one we're going to do. Was that one we said offer a summary? Mm-hmm. I would throw D out. Did I skip C? Logan says I skipped C. Did I skip C? I thought okay. I didn't. Oh, yeah. I did? Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, what about C? Review the request in term if there are any legal exceptions that might require the release of the notes. Do we keep it or do we throw it out? Tricky, tricky, tricky. Yes. I know if these are stopping y'all, these are definitely going to stop people on TikTok. I said get rid of C. Oh, okay. I okay. toss C. All right. So we've tossed A, we've tossed C, we've tossed D, right? And so we're keeping B. Advise Sarah to contact her attorney to discuss legal options for protecting her records. I'm just going to check the chat. We did toss that earlier, Logan. We did toss <laughs> A. No, we kept B. We kept, yes, I know that, but Logan's asking when she said, when did we toss A? I said, we tossed it in the beginning. Um, but so I'm going to tell you guys right now, A, B, and C are out. It's D. D. Mm, mm, mm. So um, the first thing you, <laughs> don't beat yourself up. But the first thing you need to understand is you would need to know about psychotherapy notes, how they're handled. Um, they're always separate from the client's records. Okay. They're never kept in the same place. They are not officially part of the client's records. That's something that you definitely want to make sure you know. Um, because that if they're subpoenaed, um, which they can, people can, you know, request them it doesn't necessarily mean that you should give them up, okay? Subpoena, remember, it's not by a judge. It's not court order. So most people get confused between subpoenas and court order. With subpoenas, it's requested by the, the other party's lawyer. If it's court order, that means it's by a judge. You have to comply. But with a subpoena, you can always deny and protect upon privilege of your client. In this case here, let's kind of talk this one through, but I just kind of wanted to say uh, that piece. So 
D, offer to provide a summary of the therapy sessions instead of the detailed psychotherapy notes. So offering to provide a summary of the therapy sessions instead of the detailed psychotherapy notes is the really the best next step. Uh, this approach helps protect the confidentiality of sensitive information while still complying with the legal request. Summaries can provide relevant information without disclosing all the intimate details contained in psychotherapy notes, thereby balancing legal obligations and ethical responsibilities to maintain client privacy. Please keep in mind, because um, that when I wrote this question, I did put this there, but you can also um, deny, you can, based upon privilege. Um, D is another way to address it as well. I actually had this happen to me in real life. Um, so it is another way of denying that information to also just still protect your client. Um, A, inform Sarah that psychotherapy notes are confidential. It cannot be released without her consent. While that is true, that psychotherapy notes are confidential, there are legal situations where they might be subpoenaed, which I said that earlier. It's important to navigate the legal aspects carefully while protecting the client's privacy as much as possible. Uh, be advised Sarah to contact her attorney to discuss legal options for protecting her records. Although advising Sarah to contact her attorney is a good step, it does not address the immediate need for the social worker to take action regarding subpoena. It's important for the social worker to be proactive um, to offer a solution while Sarah consults her attorney. C, review the request and determine if there are any legal exceptions that might require the release of the notes. So reviewing the request for legal exception is necessary, but it does not offer a proactive step to protect Sarah's privacy because that's what this vignette was really testing you for. What is the first step you would do to protect her privacy first? Because you can have the other options or things, yes, they sound great, but are they the first step? No. Offering a summary is a more immediate and protective action that the social worker can take. So again, this is definitely a clinical question uh, regarding professional values and ethics, 19% of the exam, but it also could be an ethics question for the master's, which is the biggest chunk of the master's exam. So I know that one was a little tricky, 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 um, but I'm hoping that you guys understood. Any questions about that? that one especially because you guys kind of struggled a little bit with that but remember that a court order yes we have to comply or we're held in content uh subpoenas are different you do need to respond to them but you're always you can call privilege any questions about that no okay well with that, guys, I'm going to get ready to let you guys go. I will see you guys uh, in TikTok um, when you guys get there. But thank you for coming in and for being a part of the session today. This will be on replay um, on the podcast probably within probably before the evening is out. So look for that if you want to listen to this again. Other than that, take care, guys. I will see you later. Bye.